start it again? As I said earlier, Paul Arthur is uh, uh, has written on uh, extensively on our current situation here in Northern Ireland, uh, and has, in a sense, participated in it over the years, like so many of us, in one way or another. So uh, it, it's a very useful sort of counterpoint to the, the global international perspective that John Paul Lederach has brought uh, to uh, base comments very firmly on our local situation here. So, Paul, you're very, very welcome. Thanks, Brian. Um, I haven't got a fully prepared speech. Uh, what I was doing over the past day or two was writing notes to myself and trying to anticipate what I thought John Paul Lederach would say. And I want to, uh, that's an easy way of saying I'm too lazy to prepare anything, but it's not entirely true. I wanted to reflect on what he had to say this morning, but as Brian says, my remarks would be very much on the local, on the here and now although I will be making some comments about the international. And when I speak of the now, I'm speaking of the period from 1998 onwards, from the signing of the agreement to its partial implementation. Uh, and I, I see that the title of my talk is meant to be a critique of leadership. It will be less of a critique and more of a reflection on the paradox and ambiguity of leadership and again, when I speak of leadership, for the most part, I will be speaking about political leadership, although you can convert that into civic leadership. Towards the end, I will begin to make some comments about civic leadership and the way forward. And the reason why I speak about political leadership is because all my practice has been working with politicians in exercises in track two diplomacy. And, you know, when uh, John Paul talked about walking shoulder to shoulder, that rang a huge bell with me, because in a number of exercises we did have, and we tried to choose locations where there was space for people to walk, often the serious business was done when people got away from the hothouse of sitting around the table. I'll try and reflect on some of that. Uh, I think it's to begin with, uh, we should say the sort of political culture under which we have operated for so long here, and Arthur Ohi, the political scientist, I think, uh, got it best when he describes it as a culture of self-pity and self-righteousness that fostered a discourse of grievance, a style of politics that had a long pedigree in Irish politics. I think that's, that is pretty accurate, very long pedigree in both sides of the island. And so, in a sense, what we've been trying to do from 1998 onwards is move from a culture of resistance to a culture of change. And I try and reflect to what extent that's been done. I also think it's worthwhile pointing out that peace agreements by their nature, as by no means, and again to go back to what John Paul was saying, is by no means the end of the matter. It is the beginning. It's the start of a journey. And I looked at uh, 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 Christian Bell, uh, uh, the uh, lawyer, has written a book on peace agreements and uh, human rights. And in an appendix called A Decade of Peace Agreements, she looked at all peace agreements signed between 1990 and 2000, and she found no less than 63. And if you look at those who have succeeded, you will find that they are very, very small in number. So uh, we have to realize, and this is, uh, uh, again, to go back to John Paul, I think he's absolutely right that peace is very, very difficult for people to accept because it does take you out of your comfort zone. I remember one political leader in 1998, I won't name him, who did say that this was a disaster because it did create a completely new ball game. And in essence, what happens is that those who are engaged in negotiations to get to a peace agreement uh, will use the sort of adversarial nature of politics. They will be making the biggest demands for their side. 
But after that, they have to revision and reform themselves. They have to begin to think in new ways. They have to begin to think about consensus rather than adversarial politics. And that can be very, very difficult for them. And so I would take as a starting point the notion, and this I'm quoting here from uh, the historian Richard Burke in a book called The War of Ideas, where he looks at really from the 18th century onwards in Ireland how people have tried to uh, uh, grasp some form of peace and find that all the time they come up against it. And what he says about the agreement in 1998 that is best viewed as merely pointing to the possibility of a democratic settlement that could evolve in the course of operating the agreement. Pointing to the possibility of a democratic settlement that could evolve uh, in the course of, exp uh, of operating the agreement. Now that's important for two very good reasons. If you look at the attitude of the adversaries towards the agreement, on the unionist side, the agreement, at least for the official unionists, the agreement for them was a settlement. That's it. We go no further. Uh, whereas uh, final settlement, whereas Sinn Féin saw its historic task as fostering a democracy that would be a regime founded on equality and not a political organization belonging to a majority. So the agreement is challenging our very basic concepts of what we mean uh, about a democracy. And this is, I think, where civic leadership has a major role to play. Also, I think it's very, very important to say that in the post-agreement period, we enter a period of either creative or constructive ambiguity. The agreement was worded in such a way that virtually anyone could take out of it whatever meaning they wanted to give it. And the literary critic, uh, Declan Kybird, uh, has this to say, which I find quite interesting. He says, much of the language of the Belfast Agreement is vague, even poetic. Uh, this is because it offers a, a version of multiple identities of a kind for which no legal language uh, exists. The Wilde, you see, he, he's putting this in the context of the works of Oscar Wilde. The Wilde who suggested that the only way to uh, intensify personality was to multiply it would have approved. But where is the lawyer who offers a constitutional definition of identity as open rather than fixed, as a process rather than a conclusion? So we are concerned with process. We are not concerned with end games. And again, if I can go back to Christine Bell, uh, which she says that peace agreements are best understood as a form of transitional constitution and that the human rights provisions must be understood as an integral part of that constitution and as having particular transitional functions. Human rights uh, protections aim to mediate between a conflict riven in the past and a better future. That last sentence, I think, is crucial. Uh, human rights protections aim to mediate between a conflict riven, uh, a con sorry, a conflict riven past and a better future. So, this is where civic society comes in. How do we create that better future? If we work on the assumption that we cannot always expect to rely on politicians. And I'll give some of the reasons as to why I think we can't always expect to rely on politicians. But I was reading just uh, last week uh, a quotation from the philosopher Francis Bacon in the 17th century at a time of heightened religious wars throughout Europe. And what he says, it's an aphorism which I think reflects where we are today. He says, if we begin with certainties, we will end with doubt. But if we begin with doubts and bear them patiently, we may end in certainty. And I think that what the agreement has done and that post-agreement period has done, it has brought us back from our incredible certainties, which produce a zero-sum game, I win, you lose, to raising in all of us the doubts that we had. I think Sinn Féin's a very good example of it, where Sinn Féin, sometime during the 1980s, moved from being a sect to a political movement. And again, it reflects what John Paul had to say earlier. He says that you need to move out of your comfort zone and in that comfort zone, what we do is we talk to each other. We reinforce our moral certainties. 
It is only when we begin to engage with the other that we are leaving ourselves open to doubt. And so in the context of the peace process in Northern Ireland, I see as a crucial date, March of 1988, when Sinn Féin and the SDLP began to engage in a dialogue which went on for about five months and didn't come to any certainty. But that was the first time that Republicans sat down with their political enemies to see if one could persuade the other. And that laid the groundwork for what was to come after the 1990s. So we're talking about a process rather than uh, agreement, a process rather than a settlement. And we're also assuming that most politicians are in the business of risk aversion rather than risk taking. And a post-agreement period is about risk taking. And most politicians who have built their careers on the notion that they represent their community, that they are in essence ethnic entrepreneurs, that they are there to quantify all the support they can get only from their community. And then they have to move into this new dispensation. If you take, for example, the Democratic Unionist Party, and you take the speech made by their leader, Peter Robinson, at their conference just a few weeks ago, it is light years away from where, where the Democratic Unionists were in, in, in 1980 when the rule was smash in vain. It is trying to encourage, trying to broaden their constituency and for the first time really to embrace the Catholic part of the population. So what I'm saying, and again it reflects what John Paul did say, I think this is very, very important in, in, in the case of time frames. It is crazy to assume that you can move at a very rapid pace because the implementation is often the most difficult part. He mentioned about just coming from Nepal. I was supposed to be in Nepal a few weeks ago when the fifth anniversary of the peace agreement had been, had been agreed to. And the idea was to have a conference around that agreement to try and embed the process and to reduce a book out of it. And of course it had to be cancelled because there was no agreement among those there about what in fact had been achieved by the agreement. We hope we'll have it at a later date. So political leaders, I think, uh, suffer from, from many natural defects. Let me quote to you uh, 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 Machiavelli. Machiavelli is the prince. When he speaks, he's speaking on the subject of the art of war. And he says, a prince ought to have no other aims or thought, nor select anything else for his study than war and its rules and disciplines. For this is the sole art that belongs to him who rules, and it is of such force that it, is not, that, that it not only upholds those who are born princes, but it often enables men to rise from a private station to that rank. And on the contrary, it is a scene that when princes have thought more of ease than of arms, they have lost their state status. So the role of the politician is to think about war and not to move beyond it. I, it's putting it very, very strongly, but I think that there is um, some justification in that. And again, since 1998, we've all had to move beyond war and begin to consider other things. And some years ago, we brought over to Northern Ireland a woman called Naomi Khazan, who is both a political scientist and a politician. She was a deputy leader of the Knesset, and she belonged to the left-wing party, Meretz. And she was reflecting on her work in, uh, in Israel and trying to deal with politici uh, politicians. And uh, she, she, she uh, noted the uh, factors and the dynamics between leaders and followers. And she described the leadership position as being one of the four Fs. Fear, fatigue, friction, failure. Fear, fatigue, friction, failure. On fear, again, John Paul spoke about this. Uh, and I want to quote the uh, novelist Milan Kundera in his novel Slowness. The source of fear is in the future, and a person freed of the future has nothing to lose. The source of fear is in the future, 
and a person freed of the future has nothing to lose. That was also commented on by George Mitchell in the report he wrote on decommissioning when he was trying to move the process forward, but it was quite clear that implementation wasn't working in terms of Republicans decommissioning their, uh, 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 their weapons. And in his report in January 1996, he said, but if the focus remains on the past, the past will become the future, and that is something no one can desire. And that really is the, that is the role for civic society and for politicians, being able to move from that past out of the comfort zone of that past, out of the great certainties of self, and moving to begin to embrace the other. So overcoming that fear factor can be a huge problem for political leaders. Again, you have to think it in terms of the Democratic Unionist Party. How could a party that said smash Sinn Féin, embrace Sinn Féin in government after 2007? How do you bring your rank and file along with you? Huge problem for any, uh, any political leader. And it takes great political skill. Fatigue is pretty obvious. It's the physical, the mental, the historical, the emotional. In a conflict such as ours, which you know went on for 32 years, but which has a mindset of centuries, fatigue sets in very easily. And often agreements are reached on the back of fatigue, and that's one of the reasons why many peace agreements do not succeed. And friction... Often the problem is that the intra-ethnic, the conflict within a particular ethnic group is as important as the inter-ethnic. Uh, one of the conclusions, I think, in the uh, report written by uh, Goldie and Ruddy was that particularly in what they call the LPU, Loyalist Protestant Unionist Community, uh, there was a feeling that their politicians had let them down and weren't really up to speed with the peace process. To the extent that that is true, one of the reasons could well be that there was that very important friction between both parties, the Ulster Unionists and the Democratic Unionists, and within parties. The very last, uh, the very last exercise in track two uh, diplomacy that I was involved in was I think in either 2004 and 2005. And what we did was we used to bring political parties, they came as individuals rather than re representatives of parties. Uh, uh, annually we brought them to Harvard for a problem solving workshop. And what we did in those problem solving workshops is we would take themes and we would never address the Northern Ireland conflict. We might have a theme on parading for example and we would look at how it played out in South Africa. Or we might have a theme on inward investment, and we'd raise the issue as, why, does, uh, why did Intel invest in Costa Rica? So you get politicians thinking outside their own comfort boxes, and they begin to draw their own lessons. The point is that the, the, a dynamic had to be created between political opponents who weren't speaking to each other. But in the last exercise we did, we did it for one party, and only for one party, and that was for the Democratic Unionists. Because and we did it with the support of the other parties. Because by 2004, the Democratic Unionists were beginning to think the unthinkable, that at some stage they may have to go into government with Sinn Féin. And how do they do that? And so 10 individuals from the Democratic Unionist Party came across, and what was clear was the extent to which that party, like any other party, is a coalition made up of fundamentalists, uh, moder uh, modernizers, technocrats. And we had a week, and there was essentially only two outsiders at that besides the Harvard faculty. Myself, who was there as the fig leaf to represent all other political parties from Northern Ireland, but really an excuse to allow the DUP to take on this. And Rolf Mayer, who had been instrumental in South Africa in moving the peace negotiations forward. He was the National Party negotiator uh, who dealt with Cyril Ramaphosa from the ANC. So friction can be, uh, uh, is obviously one of the major dangers. And finally, failure, the fear of failure. You know, it, it, uh, uh, one of the things I discovered in some of these track two exercises was the extent to which many politicians are gamblers. 
how a, a couple of them asked me did I play cards and when they found I didn't play cards they, they decided that's fine he's no problem because it is about taking risks and you're you, you, you are betting everything in succeeding but if you succeed someone else may have to fail and so that raises and this is where I want to move to a more positive view of politicians it raises the issue about politicians with vision with charisma etc and again John Paul uh, mentioned uh, Max Weber the great sociologist and it was Weber who said famously that a people must know who they are not before they know who they are. And was a great deal of that was what kept the Northern Ireland conflict going. Unionist population, for the most part, knew that they were not nationalists, knew that they were not Catholic, and therefore didn't really have to think in any sort of positive way. Weber, in a famous lecture he gave at the University of Munich in 1918 called Politics as a Vocation, made these very simple points. Politics is made with the head, and yet devotion to politics can be born and nourished from passion alone. Politics is made from the head, and yet devotion to politics can be born, born and nourished from passion alone. Now, for Weber, that passion had to be informed by what he called an ethic of responsibility, a willingness to accept responsibility for the consequence of one's actions in an imperfect world. And my argument with the culture in Northern Ireland for many years was we weren't willing to accept our responsibilities. And towards the end of the lecture, uh, Weber uh, uses a phrase first uttered by uh, Martin Luther. Weber says this, It is intensely moving when a man is aware of a responsibility for the consequence of his con conduct and really feels such responsibility with heart and soul. He then acts by following an ethic of responsibility. And somewhere he reaches the point where he says, here I stand, I can do no other. That is something genuinely human and moving. Here I can stand, I can do no other. And when we look at the examples of politicians, we can, we can come across a few examples of where people lived up to that. And the first one I would, I would mention is... Uh, Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King, when he made that famous Selma to Montgomery march, uh, which led, in fact, to the introduction of uh, a, 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 a Bill of Rights uh, and was very, very important in moving things on. Uh, what happened was that they tried to march. They were beaten back. They came back again, and uh, uh, they succeeded. And at the end of it, uh, 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 Mart uh, Martin Luther King comes out with this soaring rhetoric. I know you're asking today, how long will it take? I come to say to you this afternoon, however difficult the moment, however frustrating they are, it will not be long because truth pressed to the earth will rise again. How long? Not long because uh, uh, no lie can live forever. How long? Not long, because you shall reap what you sow. How long? Not long, because the arc of the moral universe is long, but it leans towards justice. Now, I quote that rhetoric deliberately, because it gets back to the opening remarks of John Paul Lederach when he quoted Einstein, saying that the imagination has got every possibility. And what political leaders have to do is to allow people to feel that all possibilities are, are there to be had. Or another example would be that of Mahatma Gandhi, who I think it was in 1930, led a 23-day march uh, from his ashram to the coast in protest against the salt tax. And was one of the great acts of nonviolence of the 20th century. And, of course, the classic example is uh, Nelson Mandela. In so many ways, in the negotiations, for example, with the National Party, and I'm quoting here from his bio, uh, autobiography, I never sought to undermine Mr. de Klerk for the practical reason that the weaker he was, the weaker the negotiation process. 
To make peace with the enemy, one must uh, work with the enemy, and that enemy becomes one's partner. So you don't try in negotiation to belittle the enemy. You must work with them. And essentially, uh, without going into, because I'm conscious of time, without going into a huge amount of uh, uh, detail on this, I think that what uh, he managed to do was that he moved South African politics from zero sum to one whereby he was able to persuade all the parties in South Africa that they were part of the solution. The South Africans in one sense had it easier than us because South Africans, white or black, recognize South Africa as being where they came from. Or he also did it in other ways. You know, when he was in prison, and, and he, was a, he was a strategist in the way he used, he used the threat of the use of violence uh, with that being used as a means to get to negotiation. Um, and uh, so what he did was he brought everyone along. And he did it when, for example, in his, uh, his speech from the dock in 1962 and in the Ravonia uh, 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 trials of 1963 to 1965, the ANC had no vocal way of expressing what they felt. They were censored. The only opportunity they got was when, in fact, he was on trial, because that could not be censored. And he used his speeches from the dock simply to send these messages about what the way forward was going to be. And he was incredibly successful in that. There's a movie about his embracing the Springboks for the South African World Cup. And what that demonstrated, and what these other acts demonstrated, is the power of transcendence. What Byron Bland say, says is about uh, uniting what violence has severed. And I, uh, 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 teaching uh, uh, a great deal of this stuff in, uh, at McGee, I always told my uh, students not to go and look at the Nobel speeches made by David Trimble and John Hume, revealing as they are, but to go and look at the Nobel speech made by Seamus Heaney called Crediting Poetry. This is where the imagination and the arts come into together. It is a magnificent piece of work. And he talks about acts of transcendence. And he gives as a, an example, and I, again, I won't go into the detail. I find it very, very moving every time I read this. He gives the example of the King's Mills Massacre, where you have the ten men right, lined up a, in a country road at the dark of night. Other asked, are there any Catholics among you? And, of course, there only was one Catholic. And the way he describes it is that this Catholic was about to move forward when his Protestant workmate grabbed him by the arm, said nothing, but really what he was saying, don't move, we will protect you. We're all in this together, we will look after you. But in fact, he did move, and he's pushed to one side, and the nine Protestant workmen are gunned because it was the IRA who was responsible for this. Heaney describes this as an act of transcendence. We can think of the words of uh, uh, Gordon Wilson at the time of the Enniskillen bomb. An amazing act of transcendence. So it's where we find that transcendence is in one of the ways in which we move forward. And if I, I probably have lost it now, but I did want to quote from uh, uh, Heaney's Nobel uh, 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 Prize, because what he does is that he begins by saying that, you know, this is the first time he'd come to Stockholm. But he says, as a child living in a small country dairy farmhouse, Stockholm was magical to him because as he listened to the radio and got all these weird stations, Leipzig, Luxembourg, etc., Stockholm, he said, what it did was it had broadened my horizons. And he speaks about broadening his horizons through taking steps 
Stepping stones, he calls it. Stepping stones first about how we use language and then about how we envision a future. And that's, I think, where we are at now. And I will spend the next few minutes trying to relate some of this to where I think most of you, uh, certainly from the questions that were being asked of uh, uh, John Paul Lederach, where most of us now need to go. Just make sure, yeah, I've done. Uh, and, and here, um, I want to uh, rely on the work of my friend Baron Bland, who many of you will know from Stanford. Um, and he's looking at this whole question of how you move from neutral space to shared space. And he takes the Goldie Ruddy report as his starting point uh, with their notion of WAGs, that a, a locale had to be welcoming, it had to be accessible, it had to have good quality, and it had to be safe. Now, what he says about that is that this neutral space says what it does, it means that no one can be excluded. But he says, equally, no one feels at home. It's only when you move towards a shared space that you're moving in the direction of people feeling at home. And so he begins to wonder about the notion of social cohesion and tolerance. And we, t we can take examples of uh, what he means. He talks, for example, of taking the confrontational edge of cultural symbols and rituals and other attributes of one's identity taking the confrontational age of cultural symbols and rituals and other attributions of their identity. And when I read that, I think of two particular events, annual events, that occurred particularly during the 90s in Northern Ireland. One was, of course, Drum Cree, and the second was uh, the Siege of Derry and uh, celebrating the Siege of Derry with the uh, March the Apprentice Boys March in August of every year. If you go to the out outbreak of the Troubles, one of the seminal events in creating the Troubles was that Apprentice Boys March in Derry in 1969. That's when things really broke out. And yet from the 1990s onwards, the Apprentice Boys began to revision and reimagine what that was about. That it was m not meant to be seen as something which was peculiar to us but it was part of our shared history. And so they developed, with the Bogside residents, uh, a festival to celebrate what that was about. And the success of that, I would argue, was something which had an impact on the wider Orange community, who began to see that, in fact, you could make things much more inclusive. So taking the confrontational age of cultural symbols and rituals is a beginning and uh, so essentially what he is arguing, and again it goes back to John Paul's uh, remarks this morning, is how you co uh, create a culture of trust. Uh, and uh, what uh, he calls, uh, quoting uh, another author, how you create what are called en encapsulated interests. Encapsulated interests. Uh, and that essentially is a judgment uh, that one, one's interests, uh, that our interests are aligned in such a way that as you pursue your interests, you will further mine as well. So the notion of encapsulated interests is very important. Secondly, the notion of social coherence. Social co coherence can tolerate disagreement and can expect disagreement. It goes back to Mandela, that you have to deal with the enemy. But it cannot tolerate distrust. So trust becomes the leap motif of moving forward. And we all speak, for example, of creating tolerance. I, I remember, you know, the uh, shock and horror of many people on what I call the British mainland 
at the outbreak of the Troubles, how, how could these people be so Neanderthal? How could they behave in the way that they did? And the sociologist Barbara Wooten made the point very simply. She says, tolerance often comes easy to those who don't have to face up to challenge. And where, for example, in a society such as the British mainland, religious indifference was much more strong than it was in Northern Ireland. It was pretty easy to be tolerant. So tolerance has to move beyond indifference. It has to move in the direction of uh, respect and reciprocity. Uh, a respect entails a reciprocal goodwill unconnected with intimacy or even closeness. When I tolerate someone, I open my future well-being to their influences. I implicitly give the, 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 the uh, can't even read my own writing now, uh, consent, give them consent over my life and livelihood. I must feel that my interests are encapsulated uh, uh, with, the year, uh, uh, with yours so that my interests are furthered as you pursue your own. And that really is where respect is built up. And finally, very finally, because the uh, John Paul Lederach's address was about the art and soul of leadership. I am less concerned with the soul because it is so much more difficult to formulate. Uh, Hannah Arendt in her great book on the human condition talks about the power to forgive. And she says that the difficulty with forgiveness in a political context is that it comes from a religious background. It comes from Jesus of Nazareth. And so therefore politicians find it quite difficult. But there are means, and I think that, I think that again going back to Einstein, the arts have a major role to play in moving things forward. A few weeks ago in Derry, I was at uh, a performance given, by, given in the playhouse called the Theatre of Witness, when people from uh, a woman who was in the police, currently serving in the police, uh, a woman who moved into a mixed marriage, and a woman whose husband was brutally murdered in one of the most infamous acts of the Troubles, when Patsy Gillespie was locked into his lorry 